Father, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given us to begin this new study of your precious word. I ask that the Holy Spirit be our guide, that our attention might be centered on Christ and not ourselves. Strip away that which is not truth, but just plant within our hearts that which will bear fruit. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, we just finished Romans and we're going to begin in the epistle to the Colossians. We're now beginning in this epistle and Lord willing, uh, we'll spend some, uh, some period of time looking at this epistle verse by verse. Now, I, I got to confess that this is one of my favorite letters of all the New Testament. And as I have stated before in previous studies, it's not my conviction that we're looking at Paul's reasoning or, or his logic, but we're looking at the heart of God, God's heart expressed through the Apostle Paul. It's my belief that in the Epistle to the Romans, the Holy Spirit gave us the most extensive treatment of doctrinal truth in all of the New Testament. And I am persuaded that the epistle to the Colossians is the most succinct statement of Christian doctrine in all of the New Testament. I think most people have, have heard, probably heard at one time or another that if you could only have a, a, a portion of the Word of God on a desert island someplace, you know, you'd take Romans. And that may, in, in fact, be true. I mean, I'd like to have it all. However, if you want a very brief but very specific outline of the doctrine of the body of Christ, it's the epistle to the Colossians. So I'd like to begin then with a somewhat of a brief background of the church at Colossae. You know, just to sort of establish a, a background shot, if you will. The new church probably first met in the house of Philemon because it was to Colossae that Paul returned Philemon's runaway slave Onesimus and also because Paul's epistle to Philemon speaks of the church that meets in your home finally Philemon 1 2 so it was a home-based uh, church or it had its beginning there the church seems to have been composed largely of Gentiles uh, the phrase once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds Colossians 1.21, you know, was a phrase that, that one that Paul regularly used to describe those who had been non-Jews. And certain false teachers had appeared among them propagating false doctrines that were gravely endangering the fellowship. Now then, uh, I don't know what this reminds you of, but Paul in, instructed the Romans in the final chapter of that book to avoid such ones. And now here we are in Colossians seeing them addressed. So Paul immediately responded by writing the epistle to the Colossians. And the main motivation behind the Colossian heresy uh, or heresies, I, su I should say, plural, the uh, main motivation, I believe, seems to have been to show that Jesus uh, uh, was an adequate Savior. He, wasn't an, uh, he was not an inadequate Savior. That, that uh, it was wrong to believe that he didn't do enough, that what he did was insufficient. And you may have heard that said a time or two before here on this channel. Jesus, according to these false teachers, was a created being, you know, one of the many uh, mediators between God and man. So Jesus was stripped of his deity. He was robbed of his atoning work at Calvary. And this heresy emphasized several interesting things here. It emphasized religion a works-based uh, righteousness uh, uh, based on human merit, ritualism, the abuse of the flesh, and worship of angels. 
And these were all looked at as marks of a good Christian. And to Paul, well, such a view was unthinkable. For in Christ, Paul wrote, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. Now, in the 4th century, under the reign of Diocletian, the city was completely destroyed, and persecution of Christians was strong in the region. During the 7th and the 8th centuries, it was overrun by the Ottoman Empire, uh, who soon occupied Syria, Israel, Persia, Egypt, Cyprus, Crete, and Armenia. By the end of the 12th century, the church at Colossae was destroyed by the Turks. Yeah, that's right, Turkey. And uh, you may be interested in watching some of the videos that I've done on end times prophecy concerning Turkey. And the city disappeared. Now, Paul dealt with the heresies by declaring that Christ's supremacy and the complete, the, the, uh, that we're completing Christ, the, com the completeness of the body of believers in Christ. That was the central theme of Colossians. Okay? The central theme of Colossians is Jesus Christ. The main thrust of Paul's thought about Christ in Colossians exists in 1 Corinthians 8 6. There he writes of one Lord. Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. And two other major threads run through the, the letter here, and they are the freedom and joy in Christ and the marks of true and false leaders. So this study will reveal that the Christians of the area were living a life worthy of Christ, Colossians 1.10. That's what the text says. A life that is described briefly and partially in Colossians 3. I want you to take serious note, folks, of the fact that the non-believer is not personally addressed or spoken to in this epistle, nor was he in Ephesians or Romans. Okay, these are letters to God's people. Okay? Uh, just kind of picture that as a letter. If you wrote a love letter to your wife, and, uh, and I, you know, of course, I'm not, you know, married to your wife, so you lose the letter, you drop it, I pick it up, I find it, I read it, and uh, it doesn't really have anything to say to me. It has a whole lot of sweet, uh, lovely things to say, but it, they're not addressed to me. Okay? These are God's love letters to His people, folks. That's what they are. And I want you to note that Jesus wrote to Laodicea, but Colossae was not mentioned among the letters of Revelation. So by this time, AD 96, Colossae in large part no longer existed. The worshiping of angels was was obviously stirred even more by the 8060 or 8061 earthquake event which destroyed, you know, the Tri-City area which Catholic legend uh, supposed was caused by the Archangel Michael. Pagans and misguided Christians alike in disregard of Paul's warnings we read about this in uh, the second chapter. They believe that the angel Michael uh, myth and, and numerous similar myths and legends, you know, they believed these for centuries. Paul was concerned about hollow and deceptive philosophies. Chapter 2, verse 8. Theories based on human tradition, teaching that wasn't Christ centered, that didn't depend on Christ. Food restrictions in Jewish holy days, the practice of severe self-discipline and abstention from all forms of indulgence for religious reasons, and angel worship is central. 
uh, visionary experiences are are emphasized uh, uh, law keeping yet I want you to note that he calls the believers there faithful brethren faithful brethren faithful as in they were believers in Christ as I hope to show so with all of the heresies it's no wonder that Paul says that they weren't holding fast to the head Colossians seems to have been written with two purposes in mind to encourage and ground this new Christian community and to protect them from the seduction of false teachers especially from mystical Judaism mystical Judaism which tended to uh, denigrate these Gentile Christians faith in Christ in favor of the claims of Judaism and that's sort of my introduction except to say that little has changed since those days that's what I find so amazing and that can only be a result of modern Christianity today being so unfamiliar with his word You know, it just manifests itself in different ways. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. You know, and it's impossible to go beyond the first verse without, first of all, seeing that the emphasis is on the one that did the sending, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the emphasis is not only on the message that he carries but on the one who sent the message the Lord Jesus Christ but even more than that we see that he is an apostle by means of the will of God by means of because of the will of God Paul didn't choose to do what he was doing no folks Paul did not choose his life you know, I'm not in any way asking you to believe that Paul didn't want to do what he did. But we see that he is an apostle by means of the will of God. And this in light of the common belief that our God never overrules the will of men. <laughs> really. You know, I mean, if you don't want to receive him, he won't force himself on you. You know what I mean? And, and folks, it seems impossible to me that any serious Bible student could reach that conclusion when we see how God dealt with everyone else. When we see how He dealt with Abraham, Noah, David, Solomon, Paul, and the list goes on and on and on. Where that somehow Christians think that, well, all that stopped in the modern age, or it all stopped with them. I mean, you can tell me that Paul had the choice, but when I think of Paul's experience on the road to Damascus and the declaration of the Word of God, that is not when God began to deal with Paul. He began to deal with Paul from his mother's womb and separated him for the teaching of the gospel. He trained him, he developed him, he programmed him to preach the gospel. And it might have seemed to Paul that this was all, well, according to the will of Paul, if God had not laid upon him the words, if God had not had him write different. Paul's decision was not involved in that transaction. Paul made the only decision that he could make when God struck him down, and he now became one sent by the Lord Jesus Christ by means of the will of God. And the day will come when we will see how he worked over the years in our lives. Despite our not being a, a great orator or being able to put thoughts and words together in a, in a sensible fashion, you know, mispronouncing words, splitting infinitives, and, and so on. Some of the most profound truth, folks, that I've ever heard has been couched in the most awful language grammatically speaking sent by the Lord Jesus Christ by means of the will of God God used Paul 
by means of the Holy Spirit to send to his people a simple, a simple statement of the doctrine of the body of Christ, a concise, succinct statement of the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, by means of the Holy Spirit. Not because he wanted to, but because of the will of God. And I think Satan arrays, well, I know that he arrays his messengers as angels of light, and I believe that there are messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I also believe that there are many well-meaning Christians, well-meaning Christians, who are working emotionally, not by the will of God. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ by God's will and by God's will alone, not by Paul's design, but by God. So we read in verse 2, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Now we've got several major possibilities. That there are two classes of people. There are saints and then there are faithful saints or faithful brethren. At least they're all saints. That's, you know, that's wonderful and comforting. Some of whom are faithful and some of who, uh, who are not faithful. I mean, you could take it that way. And the epistle was addressed to both. And for those who take that position, the text says, to, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Now, there's another way to take that. To the saints, even faithful brethren, to the saints and believing brethren, which are in Colossae, not at. The word at's not there. The word is in, epsilon nu. It's simply saying to the believing saints in Colossae. The word is pastuo, faith is the word, faith and, or belief, same word, and faithful equals believing. Now, you don't have to take it that way, but the text allows you to take it that way. I think the text says, is saying, to saints, even believers, brethren in Christ. That's what it says. And it doesn't make a distinction between saints who are faithful and, and saints who are not faithful or for that matter, a distinction between saints and faithful brethren. But it simply says that saints are believers and they are brothers in Christ, though they're both Jew and Gentile. Though there were likely more Gentiles there than Jews. And the text says, in Christ and in Colossae, in Colossae, Meaning God has those who are in Christ and he's put them in Colossae. He's put them there. They, like us, are both spiritually and physically where God wants them to be. That's how I look at that. Because I believe with every bit of my being that you are where God wants you to be. He works all things according to the counsel of his own will in your life. Not some things, all things. Now, it hadn't been long since Christ died when the Holy Spirit had this epistle written. It's, it's, it hasn't been very many years since the death of Christ. 20, 30, maybe at the most. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that phrase in epistle after epistle. You'll notice it's in our, our introduction. And I don't want to depart from it without saying I think most Christians would prefer perfect health and money and a uh, whole lot of other stuff. I mean, grace and peace, I mean, you know, that's fine and dandy, but, you know, that's not really what I'd want. Uh, you know, I'd rather have money and pleasure and, and, and wealth, you know, health. I can't imagine anything, folks, that you could compare with the fact that in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has given us grace and peace. I wouldn't trade peace with God for any measure of health or wealth or anything else that you could mention. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't think of a grander declaration that transcends every human difficulty, every business concept, every heart longing, every mental process. I mean, what a fantastic thought that I have peace with God. 
added to that, I operate in the sphere of His grace. This epistle was written a long time ago to dispel the idea that what Jesus did was insufficient. And yet, throughout the world today, where Christians meet to worship God, the great majority are mixing law and grace, which says that, that, that what He did was insufficient. Can we possibly comprehend the price that God paid, that we live and function in the sphere of grace? Imagine the blasphemy, and I, I can't imagine that it's anything short of that, to adulterate that with law, to mix passages of Scripture which clearly were written in the sphere of law with those which are clearly written in the sphere of grace and, and suggest that both are binding upon us today. That, it, folks, is to handle the Word of God deceitfully. That's not grace and peace. That's law and fear. That's the way that they, they preach and that's the way that they function. Folks, did you know that you are living in a period of time when God is not imputing men's trespasses unto them? You are living in a time in which you walk not under law, but under grace. And the sphere of the operation of your new creation is free of human merit and law. That so many Christians are mixing the two is, is occupied, just about occupied my every waking moment since uh, I came to know the Lord. In fact, it's become the one of the, uh, I guess, the bedrock truths of my ministry over the years. You can't live under grace and not be burdened for those who are living under the law. And that is what makes my ministry, has made my ministry mostly polemical. Well, Steve, you're always arguing all the time. Well, that's, that's, this is why. You can't avoid that. You can't escape that for the sake of unity. You know, let's throw doctrine out for the sake of unity. Let's just all get along. Doesn't really matter what the text says. Folks, that's not what we were called to do. We were called to suffer for the sake of the gospel. What Christ did was sufficient. You can't add one thing to it. Now, I think one enormous reason for this is, is the fact that from the cradle on, it, it's been, if anything's worth having, it's worth working for, and only the excellent succeed. You know? There's only those who are going to get the first place ribbon and you know, in the race and so on and so forth. Those who have the right stuff attain. And it's difficult, folks, for us to shake the shackles of goal attainment and the rewarding of personal effort where that we relax in the sphere of God's grace. If the fact that God does not love you and love you so much that He purchased you with the blood of His Son, if, if that is not an overwhelming statement of the love of God and the concern of God, then I don't, I don't know uh, what is. You know, I, I sometimes thought when I was a, a younger kid, and this has been a whole, a long, long time ago, this was like in grade school. You know, that, you know, if only I, I had a dad, you know, and I loved my dad, but, you know, I, I thought only if I only had a dad like the, the kid down the road had, you know, I'd get to do the things that he got to do. My dad quickly straightened me out on that, you know, how that, you know, I was his and there was nothing I could do about it. But I didn't, I didn't choose. I couldn't choose my father. Folks, listen to me. Jesus stood before those whom he had a right to say, he said that you are of your father, the devil. He didn't say to them, take note of the fact that he did not say to them that, here's what he didn't say. He didn't say, you know what, you know, you're, you're going down the wrong road here, and, and if you're not careful, you're going to become, uh, that's what you're going to become. You're, you know, Satan is going to become your father. You know, in, in accordance with, with what you do or don't do, you know, you're in danger of Satan becoming your father. He didn't say that. 
And he did, and he certainly didn't say the the reverse when it came to us. He didn't say that. Well, he'd really like to be our father. You know, I'd I'd really like to be your father, and and I hope if you choose me, you know, you can be my son. And that is not what the text says, folks. It's not. And God will never convince me that he became that by something that I did, that I adopted him. There is no God like our God. And early in my ministry, I was, I was greatly burdened with the fact that God did, didn't seem to do what I thought God ought to do, you know? I'd see Christians all around me hurting. You know, that marriage ought to be fixed up, that health problem ought to be taken care of, that, that business problem ought to be... Uh, resolved and in so many cases God didn't seem to do it he didn't seem to be doing this and you know it took me a long time to come to the realization that I he had the power to do it and he wasn't I didn't have the power to do you know what I would do God did have the power to do those things and and he wasn't he didn't and one of us was wrong and I finally concluded that it was me I don't think my God is wrong my God is able but I am absolutely persuaded as I spend my life in this book that God wants my attention and my affection settled on Him despite my circumstances, no matter how bad it gets. And He doesn't always do what we want Him to do. And He doesn't always do what we want Him to do so that we will rest in Him and trust in Him. Though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him. My Father never touches me, folks, except in love. He's not up there rejoicing in my suffering or my difficulties. And, and don't think for one second that I'm, not, that I'm immune from those. He is constantly, incessant, incessantly loving me, un uninterruptedly loving me, always. He is our God. He is our Father. You know, the crying heart, you know, can say, Why, Lord? And the answer comes back. It always comes back. Because it is best for you, my child. And there is nothing my God can't do. The sun stood still. The iron did swim. This God is my God. And I think sometimes we look at the sun and the iron and not the Lord Jesus Christ. The urging of this epistle is going to be to take our eyes off of that which we see, we walk by faith, not by sight, and put them on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not only God, but He's our Father. We don't have a pagan relationship with God. We don't have a distant relationship with Him. We don't have a king and subject relationship with God. We have a father and son relationship with God. He's not only God, which is marvelous in all of its concepts and impossible for me to express. But more than that, He's our Father. Verse 3, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, and who in their right mind would think that Paul is talking about praying in the sense that they will all be healthy, wealthy, wise, you know, be free of troubles and trials and you know, have nice vacations to the Bahamas. Well, for, forget I said Bahamas. Or anything else. You think that, that that was Paul and Timothy's prayer for the Colossians? Note he mentions nothing like that here. Rather, he makes reference to their trust in Christ. Thanking God constantly that you trust Christ. I think inherent in that expression is that they are not trusting law. They're not trusting human merit. And the Holy Spirit, get this, the Holy Spirit is rejoicing. These aren't Paul's words. The Holy Spirit is rejoicing over their faith in Christ. What Christ has done for them is done. A finished transaction. But the rejoicing of the heart of God is that they're trusting Christ and they're loving one another. And we will soon learn in this study how that there were factions within that fellowship that clearly believed that what Christ did was not enough. That what He did was insufficient. But we don't see God speaking to them. He speaks about them. Huge difference. 
That's a fact worth contemplating. The text says that he's rejoicing because you're trusting the Lord and you're loving one another. I want to thank you all for all of your, your comments on YouTube, your wonderful testimonies of faith, the emails that you send me, your prayers, your continued support. I want to thank you for all of that. Sue and I thank you so much. I pray for you all constantly. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.